I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. 130 additional U.S. Marines and Special Forces have been sent to Iraq. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel made the announcement Tuesday, speaking to Marines at Camp Pendleton in California. I recommended uh, to the president, and the president has authorized uh, uh, me to go ahead and uh, send about 130 uh, uh, new uh, assessment team uh, members uh, up to uh, northern Iraq uh, in the Erbil area to take a closer look and uh, give uh, uh, a more in-depth assessment of where we can continue to help the uh, Iraqis uh, with uh, what they're doing and the threats that uh, they uh, are now uh, dealing with. The news comes one day after the U.S. confirmed the CIA was directly arming Kurdish fighters known as Peshmerga, who are battling Sunni militants of the Islamic State who have seized large swaths of Iraq and Syria. Earlier today, France announced it would also send arms directly to the Kurds. The Guardian is reporting the United States is also preparing to send the Iraqi government a shipment of missiles, guns and ammunition, but it is waiting to do so until Haider al-Abadi officially becomes Iraq's new prime minister. It remains unclear if Iraq's current prime minister, Nouri al-Maliki, will relinquish power to Abadi, who has the backing of both Washington and Tehran. Maliki has rejected Abadi's appointment, saying it violates Iraq's constitution. On the humanitarian front, the United Nations says 20,000 to 30,000 Yazidis may still be trapped on the arid Mount Sinjar, where they fled, fearing attacks from Islamic State militants. U.N. Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Rita Isaac, said, quote, all possible measures must be taken urgently to avoid a mass atrocity and potential genocide within days or hours. To talk more about the situation in Iraq, we're joined by Patrick Coburn, Middle East correspondent for The Independent in Britain. He was in Baghdad last month. His new book, The Jihadis Return, ISIS and the New Sunni Uprising, is out this month with Orr Books. Patrick, it's great to have you with us from Cork, Ireland. Um, can you talk about the latest news, the sending of an additional 130 more uh, U.S. Marines and advisors, as the U.S. calls them, into Iraq? Well, it shows a little more U.S. commitment to the Kurds. Uh, I don't think it makes an enormous difference. Uh, the most, the really significant action was the airstrikes, although limited, uh, a few days ago. Uh, that was important. That raised uh, Kurdish morale. Uh, that meant a, a new uh, U.S. military involvement in Iraq. Uh, so I think that's what's uh, uh, really uh, significant. The situation of what's happening now in Baghdad um, with the new prime minister, the current prime minister, and what this all means. Who will be the actual prime minister? Well, I think, uh, you know, that Maliki has uh, is finished. I think he's been finished for some time. The question uh, was would he fight it out? He had military units that were personally loyal to him, but he found that uh, after uh, the new prime minister had been appointed, the Iranians had uh, turned against him, they wouldn't support him, he didn't have any outside uh, political support, uh, his own uh, party was uh, uh, disintegrating or uh, would no longer support him. So I think that the, the transition will happen. But I think what is wrong is to think that almost everything now is being blamed on al-Maliki, uh, both inside and outside Baghdad, that he was the person who provoked the Sunni uprising, he was the hate figure for the Sunni, he uh, produced an army that was riddled with corruption. But... Uh, I think that it, it's exaggerated. It's as if there was a magic wand uh, that would uh, be used once al-Maliki had gone. Um, but uh, there are other reasons for this uprising, for the creation of ISIS, notably the uh, rebellion in Syria uh, in 2011. This changed the regional balance of power. There was a Sunni rebellion, which... Uh, uh, Iraqi politicians of the last couple of years were always telling me if the West 
supports the opposition in Syria, uh, this will uh, destabilize Iraq. And uh, they were dead right. It wasn't just al-Maliki. Patrick Coburn, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, the current Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki is obviously not solely responsible for the situation there now. You've also pointed out in a piece uh, that he still retains the support of Iraq's Shia majority. What do you think the consequences of that will be uh, with this shift in, in power to Abadi? I I think he did uh, have that support. I don't think it's going to last very long uh, because he had it because he portrayed himself as uh, the Shia leader who protected their interests. But And he tried to get away from the fact he presided over one of the greatest military defeats in history when ISIS uh, took Mosul by claiming that uh, he'd been stabbed, the army had been stabbed in the back by the Kurds, that there'd been treachery. But um, he still had support because he had power, because he controlled the budget, $100 billion, because he controlled millions of jobs. I think once he's no longer in control of the executive and the money, that support will diminish very fast. There are millions of Iraqis who have their jobs through, through Maliki. Uh, now that's changed, and so will their support. I want to go back to Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel speaking Tuesday. People, uh, the government of Iraq, the country of Iraq, is now uh, under threat uh, for, from some uh, of the most brutal, barbaric forces uh, we've ever seen in the world today. A, a force, ISIL, and others that uh, uh, is an ideology uh, that's uh, connected to an army. Um, and it's, uh, it's a force and a dimension that. Uh, uh, the world has never seen before like we have seen it now. Patrick Coburn, you have written a book um, on ISIS, uh, the jihadis' return, ISIS and new Sunni uprising. I just want to point out, as it has come such as such a shock um, to people in the United States, you had time to write a whole book about who they are and their rise. But can you respond to what Hegel says? Uh, what has added to their surge of power now, and do you think that will change? Well, the, uh, as you said, they, they've been growing in strength uh, over the last two or three years. They captured Fallujah, 40 miles west of Baghdad at the beginning of the year, and the Iraqi government didn't have the power to get rid of them. That showed that they were growing. I, th I think that Hegel, in fact, the U.S. government as a whole and uh, uh, foreign powers steer away from one very crucial aspect of the... Uh, rise of ISIS, which is that uh, in Syria, uh, the West backed the uprising against President Assad, uh, and still does. Um, and this enabled ISIS to develop, uh, gain military experience, and then use it back in Iraq. Now Washington is saying, we oppose ISIS in uh, Iraq. But in Syria, we want to get rid of the Syrian government, which is the only real opposition to ISIS. So there's a different policy towards ISIS in these two different countries. And just as before, ISIS will benefit from that difference. And Patrick Coburn, you've also said about ISIS that it's made very few military mistakes. Could you explain what you think accounts for the extraordinary victories that it's had um, in recent months? in Iraq and Syria? Yes, it's, I mean, it's this blend, a rather terrifying blend of extreme religious fanaticism combined with military expertise and at times caution. Um, where does that expertise come from? I think it comes primarily from having a, a fort in Iraq um, in 2004 to 2009 against uh, the Iraqi uh, Shia government and against the Americans, and again gaining experience in Syria. There's probably the involvement of some former uh, Saddam Hussein officers or special forces, 
people who've been well trained. But I think a lot of it is just military experience. And when you have a long war, the survivors who are still around and still fighting are probably pr pretty good at it. In an interview with The Atlantic magazine, Hillary Clinton criticized President Obama's policy on Syria. She said, quote, the failure to help build up a credible fighting force of the people who were the originators of the protests against Assad, there were Islamists, there were secularists, there was everything in the middle. The failure to do that left a big vacuum, which the jihadists have now filled. So this has become a big brouhaha. Hillary Clinton and President Obama will be meeting tonight at the house of Vernon Jordan. There's a big party for and Jordan, um, uh, Hillary Clinton's people have put out that they'll uh, they'll hug it out. Um, David Axelrod has tweeted about um, the issue of stupid moves. Pre uh, Hillary Clinton was talking about. Uh, not making stupid moves uh, is not a policy. President Obama apparently um, uh, had talked about not making stupid moves. And David Oxelrod said, don't do stupid stuff means stuff like occupying Iraq in the first place, which was a tragically bad decision, alluding to Hillary Clinton voting for the, um, uh, the original attack on Iraq in 2003. But can you talk about this difference? It's particularly significant, of course, because she is possibly running for president. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was... Uh... I'm pretty contemptuous of it, to be to be honest, because it's it's opportunism uh, by Hillary Clinton, and it's nonsense. You know, the idea, which is very widespread, that there was a moment that, with a few more guns and ammunition, that a moderate Syrian opposition could have taken over in Syria in 2011 or 12 or 13, is just unreal. Uh, there are 14 provincial capitals of Syria. Um, Assad held all of them until uh, last year, when he lost one of them, Raqqa, to ISIS, uh, not to any of these moderates. These moderates are an endangered species on the battlefields of Syria. Uh, the opposition is now dominated, or military opposition is dominated by ISIS. They hold a third of the country. But the other uh, military opposition are people like Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the official representative of al-Qaeda of bin Laden's al-Qaeda, and some other jihadi uh, organizations. So this is sort of fantasy that there was a moderate Syrian military opposition with a bit, which, with, with a bit more support from Obama, could have taken power in Damascus. Uh, it was never going to happen. It's just uh, sheer opportunism. We're talking to Patrick Coburn. He has a new book out. It's called The Jihadi's Return, uh, ISIS and the New Sunni Uprising. We'll come back with him in a minute, and then we'll be speaking in Brazil with Glenn Greenwald. Stay with us.